Today I'd like to speak to you about purpose, about our purpose. Uh, if you want to give it a title, then a good title is, Why am I here? Why are we here? You know, we are here for a purpose. Amen? Not because of ourselves, but we're here for the purposes for which God has called us to serve. You know, I found that if we don't know our purpose, then life becomes very, what shall I say, ordinary or or it becomes just living from day to day, just existing but not thriving. There's a huge difference between just existing and thriving. And God wants us to thrive. And, and I really believe that when we really know our purpose, we can thrive. You know, you live a fulfilled life. And knowing your purpose actually helps us to, when you go through difficult situations, it will help you to carry on. No matter, uh, you know, uh, you know if, if there's a cyclone on or you, you know, lose your job, God forbid, or if something happens, if you have a purpose from God for life, you will be able to fulfill, you know, live a fulfilling life no matter what your circumstance. And I have seen that there are many people who actually live their lives from day after day without any idea for what God has called them to do. And so I'm just wanting to encourage all of us to sort of introduce us. I can't tell you your purpose, but I can sort of introduce us into ways in which you can understand or know your purpose. I was thinking about this uh, the other day, or even today. And you know, when you, uh, when you go to Namaka, you can see there's more than one homeless person. There's a lot of homeless people in Nandi. And even in Namaka, there's a lot of homeless people. When you walk the streets, you get to see homeless people. When you walk into the bread shop, you see them sitting down waiting, you know, for somebody to give them a handout. And that is like a person without a purpose. You know, they just live just for themselves and they live to feed themselves. And so there's a guy that I saw, a really big guy, he's got dreadlocks. And I see him every day be behind a row of shops there with, uh, you know, bottles of beer. And he just drinks when he finishes, he goes and stands there, you know, waiting for money. People to feel sorry for him and give him money. You know, and I'm just thinking, you know, that's not the way to live, you know. And sometimes we may not realize it, but spiritually we become like a homeless person. We have no direction in life. And we sort of just live for the sake of living, you know, oh, I just know I need to go to church, I need, you know, I know I need to go home, I know I need to read the Bible, but we have no real idea of what God has called us to do. But that is not God's plan for us. And I want to be able to take us through these few scriptures and help us to understand that God has a purpose for each one of our lives. God has made us to live for Him and for His glory. In fact, the Bible tells us, 2 Corinthians 5, it says that we are Christ's ambassadors. You know, we represent the kingdom of God. That is amazing. You know, when I walk the streets here sometimes, or even when I'm, you know, waiting for something, then I see this row of cars, you know, lights blaring, and I see, you know, you know government vehicles going, and next thing I see, I see this big Land Cruiser, and, and on it, number plates, CD and an American flag. Who is traveling in that flag? Uh, who is traveling in that, in that land cruiser? It's the American ambassador. You know, and he's escorted to the airport or he's escorted somewhere. When the Chinese uh, uh, foreign minister came in, they had to halt the whole traffic for, you know, for, for kilometers just to allow a free-flowing traffic just for the ambassador. But that's man's ambassador. Do you know you're much more important than that? You're much more important than the U.S. ambassador. Sorry, you know, to our American friends, you know. <laughs> but you are much more important than the U.S. ambassador. Much more important than the Chinese foreign minister. You are an ambassador of God. That's part of who you are. And that's something I just want to bring to you to help you and I to understand that you have more going for you than you can even imagine. And so I just hope that as I share a little bit today, you get an insight and a little bit of a taste in how you can find your purpose and you can begin to walk in that purpose. I think the reason why I'm here for the last 30-something years, I've seen so many ministers come and go, 
but Bui and I continue to be here. Sometimes we wonder why, <laughs> but, you know, but we continue to be here. I think it's basically because we have an understanding of our purpose. You know, from a very young age, we, we, we came to understand what, our, what was our purpose for being here. And so it has helped us through thick and thin just to keep serving the Lord faithfully in Nandi. And so I just encourage you, you know, if you've never known what's your purpose, you have no idea, you know, I just encourage you to start doing something towards finding your purpose. Because when you find your purpose, I'm, I'm telling you something, your life will change. If you already know your purpose and you're walking in your purpose, I, I just hope this sort of refreshes whatever you know. So it helps you along. So what we'll do is, because of time, you know, I was going to do a whole, you know, the book of Ephesians is so rich, you know, and you can go line upon line and just touch on so much. But what we'll do is, we'll basically jump over, you know, all those lovely verses we've read, and we'll go straight to verse 10. This is, this is the focus of our study today. Verse 10. And it says, for we are his workmanship. Everybody say workmanship. I think it's got masterpiece. Oh, oh no, New King James says workmanship. But I think the NIV, any of you have an NIV? NIV, what does your say? Masterpiece? Masterpiece? Okay. So here it says, we are his workmanship. The Greek word is poema, from which we get the word poem or poetry. You know, there's a beautiful artistry or rhythm. You know, it's, it stands out from the rest. And so it's amazing the Holy Spirit uses that word to describe who you are. You are God's rhythmic, beautiful, artic, you know, art, artwork. You are God's masterpiece. I love that translation. You are God's masterpiece. God put you together and made you special. Now, uh, 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 you know, I came across, uh, you know, this information that Beethoven was, was deaf in both ears. Did you know that? I actually heard, heard about his music, but I never knew he was deaf. And he wrote many masterpieces. Normally, people will write like only one masterpiece throughout their life. But Beethoven wrote so many masterpieces, and he was deaf in both ears. I didn't know that. Maybe I heard wrong, but he was deaf in both ears. And his, his music is actually stands out unique above the rest. And uh, it's been loved by thousands and thousands of people throughout the centuries. Michelangelo, my dad is also, uh, has a nickname, Michelangelo. That's how this stood out for me. Michelangelo actually did a, did a sculpture. He was a famous sculptor. Um, how do you call them? Sculpture? Huh? Sculpturist? <laughs> He's a famous sculptor. Uh, he did a famous sculpture of an, of an angel, admired. And then he said, I looked at this blank piece of rock, and I saw the angel inside the rock. And I kept digging away until, I, until the angel became free. Isn't that amazing? That's a masterpiece, and it's admired. And now the thing that comes to me is these are just men, and yet their art or their masterpieces are admired the world over. Amazing. But these are just men. And so to me, when we are made as God's masterpiece, to me there's, there's a reason why you are made a masterpiece. You, you're not just an accident. You're not just God just said, okay, you know, I got no other choice, let's just make him junior, you know, or let's just, let's just make her buoy or something. God actually designed you from the foundation of the earth. Before the foundation of the earth was made, God made you a masterpiece, right? Now, a masterpiece, I believe, has, has a double function. One is so that people can see you. They can admire the work of the creator. They can admire the character of the creator. They can admire the beauty and the genius of the creator. And so whenever people see us, they should be seeing what God is like. They should get an idea of how God speaks. They should get an idea of how God acts. This is why we are Christ's ambassadors. Because we bring the kingdom of God into this earth so that when people are looking for God, they see you and I, a masterpiece. And they stand in awe of what they see. I've heard people say, you know, say to other people, whenever people stand up and give their testimony, they said, you know, please help me to know the God that you serve because I want to be like you. Wouldn't that be nice if somebody said that to us? 
You know, I want to be like you. So can you, sh can you introduce to me your God? You know why? Because we are masterpieces. Praise God. You might say, but pastor, I don't feel like a masterpiece. You know, you should, you should see me sometimes in my most vulnerable moments at home. I'm not a masterpiece. But you know, in Christ, the Bible says, we are workmanship created in Christ. We are not masterpieces in ourselves as our, in our human nature, we are masterpieces in Christ. When we are connected to Jesus, they see us as a masterpiece. The second reason why you were made a masterpiece is for a specific function. For people to admire you, people to see you, to see the God that you serve, but also for a specific purpose or a specific function. You know, I was, I was thinking of a Japanese samurai sword. You know, I always admire knives. Please don't, uh, don't think I'm a weirdo, but I've always admired knives. I, you know, I've, I've even gone on to Amazon to see if I can get some throwing knives. <laughs> you know, it's not because I want to throw somebody, but I have this fascination with knives. You know, I like knives. I love knives. You know, so if I could get a bunch of throwing knives, boy, that, that's the greatest gift. So if any of you want to buy me a birthday gift, buy me throwing knives. I don't know how you'll get it through customs, but I think it'll be seen as a weapon. So if you can get me one, I'd be so happy, you know. You'd be on my favorite, you know, list of favorites. But anyway, you know, a Japanese samurai sword, I love those. You know why? It's a work of art. The work that goes into designing this thing, into, you know, tempering the blade is so amazing. But it's not just for people to admire the design or admire the the strength of the steel, but it's for a specific purpose, to kill. I'm not rejoicing in that, but what I'm saying is, it's for a specific purpose, right? A knife is very designed for a specific purpose. Now, you and I were created not only for people to admire the God we serve, but also for, for a specific purpose. Now, I want us to look at verse 10 again. There is something that that is said there, I just want to bring it across to us. It says, we are his workmanship or his masterpiece created in Christ Jesus unto good works, right? That's, that's, we were created as a masterpiece for a specific purpose, for unto good works. Then it, notice it says, which God has before ordained. That means before we were created, before we were born, God has already ordained this specific purpose, and then now he's going to let you walk in it. All right? Then you might say, but what's my purpose? And that's what I want to get to now. What's my purpose, Pastor? You said I'm a masterpiece. You said that God has given me a specific purpose. What is my purpose? Notice it says, God has before ordained. Means Pastor Conan has not ordained it. You have not ordained your own walk. God has ordained it. In other words, God is the only one who can reveal to you your purpose. Not your father, not your mother, not your pastor. It's God who can reveal to you your purpose. If you come to me today and you say, uh, Pastor Conan, can you tell me what's my purpose? I'll tell you, I don't know what's your purpose. You may be a good singer, but that's not your purpose. You may be a good, you know, whatever, preacher, but I don't know your purpose. I may admire that, your masterpiece, but I don't know your purpose. And this is what I want to get to now, is that because God is the only one that knows your purpose, you and I have a task. We have to seek God. So how do we get this purpose from God? Number one, we seek God. All right? Now, God doesn't just give the revelation. He doesn't just show us his purpose just like that. But we have to seek him. Now, there are some people whom God reveals his purpose immediately, like Paul. On the road to Damascus, he had an encounter with Jesus. You remember in Acts, he's, he's on his way to kill the Christians. He has an encounter with God. He falls off the horse, and then Jesus speaks to him and tells him that he'll be a light to the Gentiles. God is revealing to him already his purpose. Now, for some of us, God might tell you your purpose immediately. When you come to Jesus, God will tell you why you come to Christ, why he's calling you. He gives you a whole purpose. But for most of us, he doesn't reveal it to us immediately. But he's the only one who has your purpose. So the only way you and I can get hold of our purpose 
is to seek Him. Number one is to seek Him. All right? We must seek the face of God. You know, a lazy person will never discover their purpose because there's a cost, there's a price to pay. All right? You and I, if we really want to live a satisfying, fulfilling Christian life, we should find out what's our purpose. All right? And the only way to find out your purpose is to seek the face of God. You and I have to seek God's face. You and I have to put aside time to seek the face of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 to 10, this is, this is what it says, and I'll just read it for us. As it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of men the things which God has prepared for them that love him. In other words, I don't know what is your purpose. It says, man doesn't know. Then he says, the things which God has prepared. So God knows your purpose. He says, but God has revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. So as we seek the face of God, it is the Holy Spirit to take us deeper into his purpose. The more you spend time seeking the face of God, the more you get intimate with the Holy Spirit. And he can begin to reveal to you what is our purpose for living. It, it might not be the full picture, but it will give you an idea to start. Maybe the first few steps. But you must start seeking the face of God because it is revealed by the Holy Spirit. Hello everyone. Amen. You and I need to start digging deep. You know, there's a story of a man. He was, he was having breakfast one morning. A silly story. He was having breakfast one morning. Then all of a sudden, his face lights up and he reaches into the cereal and he picks up a, you know, a, quite a good size, size and he says, I know where God has called me. He's called me to Africa. Because he saw a cereal the size of I mean, the shape of Africa. But that's silly, isn't it? We don't know our purpose just by looking at cereal. We know our purpose from the Holy Spirit. We seek the face of God every day until the Holy Spirit begins to touch our hearts and gives us an idea of what's our purpose in life. It is spiritually discerned. According to the Economic Times, New York is the richest place on earth with over 300,000 millionaires. Did you know that? I was shocked when I saw it. Over 300 millionaires, 300,000 millionaires. And, hold your breath, $3 trillion in wealth. But I don't agree. Listen to what Miles Monroe says, the famous author and speaker. The wealthiest place on the planet is just down the road. It is the cemetery. There lies buried companies that were never started, inventions that were never made, best-selling books that were never written, and masterpieces that were never painted. In the cemetery is buried the greatest treasure of untapped potential. In other words, people come and they go and they never discover what God is calling them to do. And while the, new, uh, while the economic time says New York is the richest place on the earth, uh, the richest place on the earth is a cemetery. It's sad, isn't it? That many people live and die and they never know what God has called them to do. So I really encourage us today to start seeking God. You know what that means? We must start being willing to pay a price. Fasting, prayer, in the word, Setting aside a season, not just an hour, but a season to seek God. Being willing to spend a regular time of seeking God. And that goes against the very grain of Western living, isn't it? It goes against the very grain of consumer-led living. Where we want the next comforts of life. We don't want to pay the price. We want, the, you know, even the best pillows. The best beds. You know, we want their conditions. We want the best food. You know, many years ago when I announced fasting, a lady came to me and said, Pastor, I can't even fast breakfast. I said, can you at least start? Start somewhere? And it takes a cost 
to find your purpose. Number two is serving God. You know, it is while I was looking after, as a, as a very young Christian, looking after an Indian family by myself and this one family. I didn't have many families, just one cell group, one Indian family. That was my job. And I looked after them every Monday. I was, I was in Lotoka, and that was my cell group. My house was on the top of the hill. Their house was on the bottom. So every Monday I'd go down to their house and I'd do songs and i preach the word. And we pray together. We have a tea together. We have a discussion together. Sometimes they come up with their problems. Sometimes I run around for them. But you know something I discovered? In the middle of running a cell group, I discovered I love to pass the people. In the middle of, you know, interacting with this, with this one family, I love them so much. I even came to know their family issues and all their family background. I came to know the extended family. And I loved pastoring just from serving. You know, when we are knee-deep in serving others, we get to discover our potential. We get to discover our purpose. We see God, but it's also in serving God. You know, we can't find our purpose with just staying home in remote control. We can't find our purpose with just not committing to, to serve God in anything. Has we served God in the children's ministry? Has we served God in the youth ministry, singing? You know, you can even rotate. You know, for the next few months, I will serve God in the children's ministry. I'll see what it's like. In the, and after that, I'll serve God with the youth ministry for the next few months. After that, I'll do the men's ministry, if we have a men's ministry. And then we'll do something else. Maybe singing in the front. We'll keep rotating. And then I'll find something in which my heart gets, gets to be... Something in my heart starts to burn. The more you begin to do something, you find that your heart begins to burn towards that particular area. But it's only in serving that you begin to find, Rick Warren calls it your shape. You begin to find your shape. You begin to find your passion. I was serving God looking after the prayer ministry in Alotoka Church. I would do the prayer list and I would call everybody to prayer. One Early one morning after praying all night with a, with a group of people and we were praying in the church and we were praying, praying. This was four o'clock. We were breaking off the prayer and we all gathered in this room holding hands. And in the middle of that, God showed me his vision, his heartbeat for the lost. That's how I knew. Apart from pastor, I would be called to evangelize. I was called to the lost. God showed me his vision. I heard his voice. He spoke to me clearly. And I knew. But it was in the middle of that serving God that I discovered my purpose. It was more than 30 years ago, but it's still going on today. Every now and again, I can actually close my eyes. I can hear the same voice. I can still see the same vision. And that keeps me alive and going. But it would have never happened if I had just stayed home, gone to church, go back home. There's nothing wrong with coming to church. You should come to church. Amen? Amen? But we should do more. That means serve. Get involved. Get our hands dirty. Get involved in the prayer ministry. Get involved with this online. You know, we have an online ministry. Come on, get involved with those things. In the middle of doing these things, you discover a flame start to burn in your hearts. Serving God. Lastly, submit to God. So we... See God, we serve God, and we submit to God. What do I mean, Pastor? It simply means obedience. When God starts showing you just an idea of His purpose, we should do the next thing is take a step. Always take a step. Whenever God shows you something, take a step. Why? I tell you this. You can see it throughout Scripture. Whenever God tells something to somebody or gives something to somebody, He'll always test you. Always. He'll test you. And you'll see how you move before he gives you more. So whenever he gives you an assignment, he waits for you. When you take the first step, then he gives you the next one. 
You take the next one and he opens this picture up to you over and over, bigger and bigger, until you're flowing in obedience. But it starts with your first step. You and I need to take that first step. Somebody told Reinhard Monke, the famous German evangelist, and said, Pastor, Reverend, I haven't heard the voice of God for many years. What should I do? You know what Monke told him? He said, the only thing I can tell you is this. Go back to the last time that he spoke to you and obey that, and God will start to speak to you again. That's amazing, isn't it? Because God is always testing us. He spoke to Abraham and he tested Abraham. He spoke to David, tested David. Everyone God speaks to is a test. Submit to God. And one thing I found is this. When you and I begin to walk the life of obedience, God opens the doors of provision. Amen, everybody. You might be thinking, God doesn't provide for me. No, no, no. Go back to the last time he spoke to you. God is not supplying my needs. No, no, no. It's not about God supplying your need. It's about obedience. It's not a matter of how much I have in my bank account. It's a matter of how much I walk in obedience. That's the issue. If I start taking one small step at a time, then everything that I need to walk a successful life of obedience, God supplies. So the issue is not so much as what I have, but what I, how much I obey. That's the issue. Amen, everyone. Listen to Abraham. Hebrews 11 verse 8, it says, By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. God showed him his part of his purpose and say, Abraham, leave the earth of the Chaldees, leave Babylon and go to this place, Canaan. The Bible says he obeyed and he went out not knowing where he was going. Sometimes God will show you something and you have no idea, no clue what's going to happen. So you just know that you have to take a step of faith. When God speaks to you many times, it's to stretch you also, test you, but also stretch you. Because you live in your comfort zone all the time. And sometimes God has to stretch us and he pushes us out like an eagle does to the eaglet. And, you know, unless you are pushed, sometimes you have to be, I mean, you have to be pushed in order to fly. And Abraham went out not even knowing where he was going. That's amazing. And sometimes I feel like Abraham, you know, here we are. We have no support and yet we're going to go to Nandi and establish a church. We've never got support from overseas. We've never received support from our denomination when we used to be in a denomination. But you see, God has been faithful because when I saw the heavenly vision, to, that was another vision to start a church in Nandi, we took the step. We were just one month married. Can you imagine? With Bui. One month. You know, the Bible says when you get married, have one year holiday. I'm not saying for Junior, he cannot have holiday. He was married on Saturday, Sunday, he's playing in the front. Sorry, Junior. I owe you a lot, but anyway. <laughs> but that's what the Bible says in the Old Testament. You know, when you get married, take one year off to all the soldiers. Take one year off, spend time with your wife. But we and I, one, one month married, we started the church. But you know, God is so faithful. God has given us over and abundant whatever we needed at any time. So I really encourage all of us, is you don't just seek God, you don't just serve God, but as God begins to start revealing something to you, it might not be the whole vision, but just something, take a step. And then the next one, and then the next one. The next thing you know, provision opens. The door opens, and you think, oh, wow. You know, in the book of Ezekiel, I think it's in verse 37 or verse 47, the Bible says as a man goes out and he, and he goes out into this river and it's only ankle deep and he's still struggling, right? But he goes a little bit further and it's knee deep. Then he goes a little bit further, it's waist deep. And he goes deeper and deeper and he begins to swim. His feet, his toes cannot touch the bottom anymore. You know what happens when you really swim? What happens is there's less stress on your frame. You can swim and there's no more stress. 
That's what it's like to flow in the provision and the blessing of God in obedience. When you don't obey God, it's like you're walking ankle deep and you're struggling every day. And you're trying to obey and you're struggling with this thing. Let me tell you, when you start obeying God, you go deeper and deeper and deeper until one day you are floating. Amen, everyone. Seek God, serve God, and submit to God. Once you start doing this thing, you find your purpose becomes, begins to be revealed more and more for your life. And it's true for anyone. You know, anyone, whoever you are. You might be a school student. You might be an older gentleman. God can show you his purpose. If you really have a heart for knowing your purpose. Don't wait till one day there's a cemetery down the road and then you say, oh, if only, if only. When I die from this world, I want to stand before Jesus and my Lord and Savior tell me, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I don't want him to tell me, you full of excuses. <laughs> Come into heaven, but you'll have the corner house. <laughs> wow. I want him to say, well done, good and faithful servant. You see that mansion there? That one is yours. Conan Hatch. And if we want part of it, I'll tell him, no, we're not married in heaven. Go find your own mansion. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Mother's Day. I forgot Mother's Day. <laughs> you can share my mansion. Just for today. So anyway. <laughs> Hey, but every one of us will be giving account for ourselves alone. Okay, your husband won't give account for you, your children won't, your parents won't. I will give account that day, and I want to hear the words, well done, the good and faithful servant. One day I want to stand before God and God tell me, well done, there's your mention. Praise the Lord. So whether you're a husband or a wife, don't depend on your partner. You pray to the Lord for yourself. You seek the Lord for yourself. It's your calling, not your husband's calling. It's your calling. You seek the Lord. Amen. Let's pray and just trust the Lord with our lives this morning. Well, let me read to you this final verse. Apostle Paul writes this towards the end of his life, and this is what Apostle Paul says. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 to 8. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them that also love his appearing. Let's pray.